presence and it's great to have you in the house of God this morning and uh, as we get closer and closer to the end of the year there's so much to be thankful for there is so much to be grateful for God has been good to us uh, in all circumstances he's Lord and he's the Lord of the mountain and the Lord of the valley I don't know what your life has been and what your story has been, but you are here, and to God be all the glory for how far he has brought you, and he will take you through to the end of the journey. Amen. Amen. Well, yesterday uh, at the Central University, we graduated uh, over 1,600 new graduates from the university, and we want to thank God for all those who graduated. I'm sure some of you sitting here graduated from Central University yesterday. How many of you here are graduated? Let's see you. If any one of you graduated yesterday, where are you? Yeah, 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 yes. God bless you and wherever you are, God bless you. Yes, some of you here, God bless you and be great ambassadors uh, to that university and may the Lord bless you and increase you in all that you do. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, um, my message today is titled, God is Fighting for Us. God is Fighting for Us. We are familiar uh, with the song, God is Fighting for Us, uh, pushing back the darkness, lighting up the kingdom that cannot be shaking. There is an assurance as the body of Christ that God is with us and he is not with us passively, he is with us actively. He is not just with us, he is also fighting or he's engaged in warfare on our behalf. And we're going to explore what it means uh, uh, when we say God is fighting for us and what to expect uh, from that battle. Uh, I'm going to read the passage we looked at last week and then we will uh, ship off from there. Exodus chapter 14 verses 13 to 14 and then we would uh, go to Exodus chapter 15 verses 1 to 4. Exodus chapter 14, 13 to 14, and Exodus 15, 1 to 4. Let's hear the reading of God's word. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. You can underline the phrase in verse 14, the Lord will fight for you. It's a very assertive statement. It's a very powerful statement that commits God to the cause of his people. The Lord will fight for you. This passage and many others in the Bible clearly state that God fights for his people and uh, I would not say much about this because I'm going to come back to it at the end of my message and uh, draw some lessons from it um, it is something that God does for us even when we are not aware of it then Exodus chapter 15 from verse 1 to 4, after God had delivered Israel through the sea, the Red Sea, uh, the Bible says from verse 1 of Exodus chapter 15, Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. 
He is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. Verse 3. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea. His chosen captains are also drowned in the Red Sea. Underline in verse 3, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is a man of war. Those of you who've been uh, in the church for a while uh, can identify the words in the passage in Exodus chapter 15 because we used to sing it. Uh, I will sing unto the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider he's thrown into the sea. Those of you newcomers have no idea what that song is. If you know that song, it means you are, uh, you, you, you are there. And uh, if you don't know it, you are also there. Amen. So I want to just focus on the phrase, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is a man of war. It's a very interesting statement in the Bible because we also know that God is not a man. So if God is not a man, how then does uh, the passage describe him as a man of war? This description of God as a man of war is very important. Now, uh, a few weeks ago, I uh, spoke about uh, the fact that sometimes the Bible uses human language to describe God. And when that happens, it is called an anthropomorphism. Uh, it is using uh, human characteristics to describe God. So you hear things like the hand of God, or the face of the Lord, or the Lord smelled, or the Lord sees, or the Lord walked, and, and so on. And, and this is one of those, the Lord as a man of war. Uh, it is not exactly that God is a man, but because we are human beings, God speaks to us with descriptions we can understand. So when uh, he talks about the hand of God, uh, it doesn't mean that God sits somewhere and he has a hand like ours, but it's a way for us to appreciate and understand God. So the passage here says the Lord is a man of war. Uh, you can render it as the Lord is like a man of war. Uh, the, the, the phrase a man of war simply means a warrior, somebody who goes to war, somebody who fights in a war, uh, somebody who is very strong in battle. So after Egypt or Israel has come out of Egypt, the first thing they understand about God is that he is a man of war. Can you imagine for 400 years, they've never fought a battle for 130 years. And for much of the time, they've been under bondage. Now they have been delivered. And their first understanding of God is that this God we worship is a man of war. Why? Because they saw God in warfare, defeating Egypt just now. And so they say, wow, we serve a God who is a man of war, who fights for his people. Throughout the scripture, uh, that image of God as a fighter is portrayed. In Psalm 89, verse 8, we see him as the Lord of hosts. It says, O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty like you, O Lord, your faithfulness surrounds you. And that phrase of God as the Lord of hosts runs throughout the Old Testament. It sees God as the head of a host. A host there means a large army. So God is the Lord of hosts. He is a leader of an army of hosts. The host of God include various hierarchies of angels, cherubim, 
seraphim, and other supernatural beings. And their number is beyond count. The Lord is the Lord of hosts. In Psalm 24, verse 8, he is described as the Lord who is strong and mighty. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. So, the Lord is a man of war. He is the Lord of hosts. He is the Lord strong and mighty. And in the same Psalm 24 verse 8, it says that the Lord is mighty in battle. That phrase, mighty in battle, uh, describes somebody who wins his battles. When somebody is called mighty in battle, it means that every time he goes to battle, he comes up winning. He's the kind of person you want to have around you when you are fighting. A person who is mighty in battle. There are people who are mighty in battle. And when, when I was a kid in my neighborhood, we fought for nothing. I don't know why we did it. You know, we just get up in the evening, we, we go to the next area of our neighborhood and we're coming to fight. You know, and, and they pair us. They say, you fight this one and you fight that one. And sometimes you get beaten, sometimes you beat people. You give and take. But, but you just fight. I don't know whether neighborhoods still do that in, in Ghana, but we, we're just fighting. We didn't, they didn't pay us for it. We don't earn anything. You just go home, back home, you are bruised. Your clothes are tattered. Your mother is angry. You get beaten at home too. You know, but we just fight. And, and, and there were people amongst us, some of our neighbors, and I can think of a few boys in my neighborhood who were mighty in battle. Mighty in battle. I mean, anytime we're going to fight and they are with us, we feel very confident because they never lose a battle. They never lose. For some reason. I don't know where they learned fighting from, but for some reason, these boys never lost a battle. They always win. Now, that is the image that the Bible has when it says the Lord is mighty in battle. It's a person who never loses a battle. Whenever you're going to fight, you wish he was on your side. If he's on your enemy's side, you are in big trouble. The Lord is strong and mighty. The Lord is mighty in battle. He never loses a battle. That is the God we serve. He never loses a battle. So what does it mean when the Bible says that God is fighting? When the Bible says God is fighting, what does it mean? Now, it's very important when we read the Bible, and I take my time to teach these things because somebody can take this verse and run with it in a direction that will hurt all of us. Uh, <laughs> you have to understand that the Bible uses different kinds of language to bring us the word of God. Sometimes it is historical language. Sometimes it is legal language. And sometimes, as in this case, it is poetry. So when you are speaking poetically, you, uses, you use different things like metaphors, similes, and so on. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about? That's why you should have paid attention during English <laughs> when you were in school. You should have paid attention. You run away from English class. You say, well, what, what am I going to do with English? I'm not an Englishman. Metaphor. You were taught in school. You were taught in school. You didn't learn. Similes. Analogies. You didn't learn. Poetry, you didn't learn. Now you realize you've come to face it in the Bible too. All right. So sometimes the Bible uses poetry. And when it uses poetry, the language is a bit flowery. So you see things like the Lord fights, the Lord is a man of war. Now I don't want you to imagine God like the, my neighborhood friend, you know, who takes off his shirt and goes out to do one on one with somebody else because God has no equal to fight with and nobody can hit him 
and nobody can attack him. So when the Bible says God is fighting, don't imagine a wrestler or a boxer. Maybe like uh, Anthony Joshua who is going to face Ruiz very soon. Or Mike Tyson who bit somebody's ear. Don't think of God <laughs> like that. Because, because normally when we think of a fighter, you know, somebody who gives out blows and then he gets blowed too. So God, nobody blows God. Boom, they've hit God. No. So when the Bible says God is a fighter, it's a poetic language. It is not an actual language that God gets into fight and gets beaten or gets hit or gets attacked because God cannot be attacked. None can even approach his presence. All right? So get that in mind. When we say God is fighting for us, he is not engaged on one-to-one -one blow exchange with somebody else. Because no one can access his presence. So, when the Bible says God is fighting, how does he fight? Just give you a few, uh, two verses, um, just to clarify that to you. Matthew chapter 26, verse 52 to 53, and then Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 to nine. How does God fight when we say God is fighting? This is Jesus speaking. And Jesus said to him, Peter, put your sword in its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to the Father and he'll provide me more than 12 legions of angels? Now Peter is fighting the enemies of Jesus who have come to arrest him. He cuts off somebody's ear. Jesus has put away the sword because if I really want to fight, I'm going to tell the father he'll give me legions of angels. In other words, uh, when God is engaged in fighting, he uses somebody else to fight. And Jesus is telling us there are angels. And then uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, 7 and 9. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Nor was there a place for, found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Uh, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So even dealing with Satan himself, God does not fight him. Michael fights him. Jesus says, if I want to fight, angels will come to fight. So, how, when we say God is fighting for us, how does he engage in that fight? God uses angels to fight for him. Angels fight for God. Angels fight for God. So anytime you read the Bible and you see God described as fighting you have to know there's always angelic presence when you read the battle is the Lord's there is angelic presence when you read the Lord is a man of war there is angelic presence any language in the Bible that involves battle that God is involved in requires angels to be present because the angels are the host who fight for God they act at, God, at God's command. They wage war against God's enemies. And that's very important. Angels don't respond to our instructions. We are not the Lord of hosts. He is the Lord of hosts. He instructs them. And they don't wage war for you. They wage war against God's enemies. If God's enemies and your enemies happen to be the same, then you are on, good, on the good side. And they operate in both the spiritual and the physical worlds. It's very interesting because in the, in the account in Revelation, this warfare is taking place in the heavenlies. But when Jesus spoke in Matthew, he was talking about warfare here on earth. So angels can fight totally spiritual battles, and they can also be engaged in physical battles. 
no, let me put it this way they can be engaged in war in the physical world in the physical world so throughout the scripture you see God fighting and getting into fight and you read things like the battle is the Lord's God will fight for you God goes ahead of you and fights and and we see especially in the life of Israel many times when God fought for them you see in the lives of some people of God in the Bible many times when God fought for them so how does God fight for us how does God fight for us God fights for us in many ways he fights for us in ways we cannot see and I will just walk you through just about five ways in which God fights for us how does he do it when God is going to fight for his people how does he do it Sometimes in the Bible, you read that God sets enemies against themselves. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, you will find that there was a battle between Ammon and Moab against Jehoshaphat. And uh, when the people have gathered together, the armies had gathered together, the people of God went to battle because God says, you don't need to fight in this battle. The battle is mine. Just watch what I would do. So Worship. So the people go into battle worshiping, singing for his good, his mercy endures forever. And when they went to the battlefront, the enemies who had conspired to fight the people of God had turned against each other and fought against each other and killed each other on the battlefield. So sometimes God fights for his people by turning the enemies of his people against themselves. So people sit in conspiracy against God's people. They plan how they are going to do it. At their planning stage, they are together. At the warfare stage, they are divided. And when they get divided at the warfare, not only are they divided, they start seeing each other as the enemy. May that be your story. Because when God fights for you, one of the things he's going to do is he's going to turn the conspirators against themselves. People who rise up against God's people. Sometimes you can hear the number of people who have gathered and conspired. And you wonder how can this be done when God gets into the battle. He says you don't need to fight, just watch what I will do. And he tells these people, uh, by the way, uh, that's your enemy. And by the way, that one is your enemy. By the way, that one gossiped against you. And these people who seem to be so tight and united start fighting against each other and killing each other. God fights by turning the enemies of his people against each other. That's one way he fights. The other way God fights is that he terrifies the enemy. You'll find that in 2 Kings chapter 7, when the Syrian army had gathered against Samaria and laid a siege on them, the Bible says that in the night, the Syrian army heard a sound. And when they heard a sound, they interpreted it that an army was going, coming against them. In reality, it was just four lepers coming against them. But they heard it as if an army was coming against them. They got up there. They didn't even pack their clothes and run out because God has terrified them. May the Lord terrify his enemies. People who have gathered will run because God will cause them to hear a sound from heaven. And I believe God will do that for his church. He will terrify the enemies of the cross. In the middle of the night, they will run without packing their stuff. They will run because the terror of the Lord has fallen upon them. Many times in the Bible, you find God fighting by putting fear in the enemy. 
He makes them hear a sound. He makes them see something. He confronts them in a way that so scares them that instead of staying on the battleground, they just run away from the battleground. Sometimes he turns the enemy against himself. Sometimes he just terrifies the enemy. The enemy will be terrified. Amen. Amen. Third way that God fights for his people is that sometimes he turns the forces of nature against the enemy. This is what happened to Egypt in the Red Sea. The Bible says God troubled them. Their wheels started getting messed up on the ground in the sea. They couldn't ride again. The forces of nature are against them and the sea comes to cover them. God uses the forces of nature against his enemies. In the book of Joshua chapter 10, Israel goes into battle against the kings of the Amorites and different kinds of people, including Adonizedek of Jerusalem. And the Bible says that on the battlefield, God allowed hailstones to fall on the enemy. And when the hailstones had knocked them, the Bible says more were killed by the hailstones than by the sword of the Israelites. And, and that's when Joshua prayed and said, Lord, let the sun stay, stay, stay and the moon stay because I haven't finished. So you see hailstones, sun, and moon conspiring against the enemies of God. That just tells you God can use the forces of nature to fight his battles. He can use the wind. He can use water. He can use the sun. He can use the moon. He can use the stars. He can use the earth. He can use sand. He can use all kinds of things to fight. It's like people who, 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 who know how to fight with everything. They are ninjas. God is a ninja fighter. He will throw stone. He will throw whatever. He will blow air. He, will, he, will, he, he, he just is a ninja warrior. Now, don't leave here and go and say, from now on, God is a ninja. It is an anthropomorphism. An anthropomorphism. It is using a human language to describe an act of God. Because we human beings know ninjas, so I'm saying God is like a ninja. But God has not become a Japanese just for your information. You know, people misinterpret scripture very easily. So I have to take my time to teach these things. So God is able to turn nature against the enemy. And sometimes God delivers his people from the enemy's scheme. Sometimes he allows them to get to the point of even catching you. And it seems as if now they have succeeded. And then he delivers you. As he did to the three Hebrew boys. They were caught. They were put into the fire, and the fire did not burn them. Daniel is put into the lion's den, and the Bible says God shut the mouth of the lion. So sometimes he will confuse the enemy, and they will fight each other. Sometimes he will scare them. Sometimes he will use the forces of nature, and sometimes he just allows you to walk into the trap. And then he delivers you. He fights for you. He will make the fire not burn you and the lion will not eat you. But you will be in the lion's den. So just because he allowed you to go through the fire doesn't mean you are going to be burned. And just because he allowed the lion's den to be your home doesn't mean you'll be eaten by lions. He delivers in many ways. Sometimes before the battle, sometimes within the battle. But the Lord is a mighty man of war. He's a ninja warrior. Or in Ghana we say he's an Asafu fighter. He delivers his people from the schemes of the enemy. And then sometimes God delivers fights by 
allowing the enemy to fall into their own traps. This is what he did in Esther chapter 7 against Haman who set up gallows to hang a man of God, Mordecai, and set an appointment for the people of God to be executed throughout all the land. And the gallows he has set up was used to hang him. It is very dangerous to set traps for God's people. Very dangerous. Because for all you know, God will make you set the best traps for yourself. So don't be too frightened when you hear people are setting traps. It may be that God is just waiting to use it against them. So God fights for his people in many ways. He fights for his people in many ways. And throughout all our battles, we have to be cognizant of the fact that the Lord is a man of war, and if we are his children, he is on our side. There are battles you are engaged in now that are bigger than you. And the only way you will win that battle is for God to get involved in that battle. Somebody say, God is fighting for us. What does God fight for? What does God fight for? What kinds of situations will get God involved in a battle? There are people who fight for land. Because they need to get land. Some fight for money. Some fight for girls. Oh yeah, it's true. Major wars have been fought in this world because of beautiful ladies. And nations have fought over women. Nations have fought for money. Nations have fought for oil. Nations have fought for land. Nations have fought for all kinds of things. So when God is getting into a battle, what is he fighting for? He must fight for something. He can't just go and fight like my friends when we were kids and you go home and you didn't win anything. Then your parents are angry with you too and, and beat you up at home. So what does God fight for? What gets God to say, I will fight for you? Few things. First, he fights for his sovereign will to be done. God fights for his sovereign will to be done. He fights for his purposes to be established. The most important agenda of God is his will. That is why in the Lord's Prayer, the first request in the Lord's Prayer, if you know the Lord's Prayer, it stays, starts with our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, that is not a prayer request. Our Father, who is, uh, who is in heaven, is an affirmation. Hallowed be thy name is praise or worship. Then it goes to the first request, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Before God deals with your daily bread, his will must be done. The number one thing God fights for is for his will to be done. And whenever his will is under jeopardy, he will fight to restore his will. That is why when God gives you a sure word my son 
I will do this for you. My daughter, I will do that for you. And people mess with that. God gets into the fight because his will must be enforced. He's the enforcer of his will. And don't ever think that a word God gives you will be sabotaged by a human being or the devil himself. If it is the sovereign will of God that you prosper and anybody touches that, God has to get into the battle to rectify the situation and establish the status quo. That is your victory. So I don't know what the sovereign will of God is concerning you, but God will fight for his will. When God has a will that he wants to bring to pass, he will fight for the will to be brought to pass. He said to Abraham, your descendants shall be slaves and afterwards I will bring them out. And when the time came, he said to Moses, go and tell Pharaoh, it's time up. What I said 400 years ago, this is the time. He should know what is going to happen and let the people go for his own good. And if he doesn't let them go, I will touch him. So Moses went and said, Pharaoh, God says the people should go. He says, are you serious? He says, God says, if you don't let them go, he will touch you. He says, I don't even know who God is for him to touch me. Says, okay, let it start. Water, blood. Next day, frogs. Next, next day, boils on people. And then people are itching. And, and people are getting all kinds of problems. And, 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 and then Darkness. Cows are dying. They said, even the magicians of Pharaoh said, Sir, we know this stuff. This one, where it is coming from, we haven't been there before. This is the finger of God. We haven't seen this before. And the last one, God says, You want me to touch you? I'll touch your future, your children. And they said, ah, they still pursue. And he touched the whole army. When God has to establish his will, he will touch anyone who is interfering in his sovereign will to be done. He will. He will go to battle and he will do things. You know, people know God. As, He's a merciful God. He's a good God. Yeah, he's good, but there's another side of him. He's a Lord mighty in battle. And if you don't stay on his good side, and you go and stay on the battle side, you are in big trouble. He fights for his will to be established. Secondly, he fights for his name to be glorified. When his name is on the line, he will fight. When anybody says, I'm going to do this because you say you are a Christian, I'm going to disgrace you, I'm going to dishonor you because you are a child of God. They put the name of the Lord on the line, God will fight for you. God will fight for you. And thirdly, he fights for his righteousness to be established. He fights for what is right, for justice, for fairness, for equity, for right treatment of his image, human beings. God fights for his righteousness to be established. Whom does God fight for? Whom? This is a very important question. Is God interested in fighting the battle between Asante Kotoko and Accra has a folk. Is that a battle God will get involved in? Is God going to fight the battle between Ghana Black Stars and Nigerian Green, Green Eagles? Does God fight your wife because she didn't cook well for you? 
Or your husband, because he's watching too much TV. Are these battles God gets into? Because, you know, sometimes people say, God will fight for me. You know, husband will say, God will fight for me. Your wife, God will fight for you. And wife tell her, God will fight for me. Is God going to fight marriage battles? When Ghana is going to play Nigeria, we pray, God will fight for us. Send your mighty power, come down now. Oh Lord. And then Nigerians are also saying, send your mighty power, come down now. So whose side is God going to fight on? So which, whom does God fight for? If God fights, whom does he fight for? So I'm going to show you whom he fights for. So you don't invite him to battles, he won't fight. Whom does God fight for? God, number one, fights for his redeemed covenant people. His redeemed covenant people. In the Old Testament, that was Israel. In the New Testament, it is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The entire body of Christ. In the victory of the church, we have our victory. So when anybody rises against the church of Christ to fight the church, God will have to fight to deliver his redeemed people. Not just individuals, but the church as a body. But because we are also members of the church, we participate in the victory. Just like God fought Egypt on behalf of Israel as a nation. But if you were a Jew going through the Red Sea that day, you also had your personal victory in the larger victory. But God's fight was not for you as a person, but for the entire body. Anybody who comes against the church, God fights them. He fights for his redeemed covenant people. Secondly, he fights for those who uphold his name. Elijah against the prophets of Baal was a battle for the name of the Lord. It wasn't Elijah's personal battle. It was a battle to establish Jehovah as the God to be worshipped. When a believer upholds the name of the Lord publicly, they allow God to take sides with them in battle. Those who uphold his name, he fights for them. Number three, he fights for those whom he uses for his purposes. God's will is done by people. And when people want to fight people that God has a purpose for, God will fight because of his purpose that he has called somebody to achieve. So when you read the Bible, you will see uh, that most of the battles that God fought for people, whether it's for David or some other person, it was because of the purpose of God. Not because David is a nice guy, but because the purpose of God has to be established. And if you interfere in the purpose of God because you don't like David, God will fight you because his purpose of God requires David to do what he must do. So sometimes a person, you may not like a person, but there is something God has determined to do with the person. And God says, this is the person I'm using to do this. And if you try to interfere in the person's safety, I have to neutralize you. God is a terminator. That's an anthropomorphism. He will terminate you. Now, it doesn't mean he hates you, but you are interfering. You are interfering in his plan, and he has to push you aside. And, and when God push you aside, the hand is so strong, you go, go, you roll to the sea. So, just him pushing you aside can cast you aside. So, he fights for the people who are fulfilling his purposes. And the last group of people that God fights for, this is a dangerous group. Those who have no one to fight for them. And in the Bible, God warns people. In Exodus 22, verse 22, 24, he says to Israel, you shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. 
if you afflict them in any way and they cry at all to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will become hot and I will kill you with the sword. Your wife shall be widows and your children fatherless. Some people read this and say, I, 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 this is Jehovah. We thought he's, he loves everybody. No, he says my wrath will be hot and I will kill you if you touch some particular people. So when somebody has no one to defend him and you deny the person the cause of justice and fairness and equity, God's anger becomes hot and he will fight you. Even if you are his child. Because this was not against Egypt or the Assyrians. This is to, each, to Israel. He is saying to Israel, his covenant people, if you mess up with a widow, a fatherless person, somebody who is weak, I will kill you. And he's telling Israel, in other words, even if you are a believer and you pervert justice, you expose yourself to the wrath of God. Someone said, but Christ has redeemed. Yeah, you, 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 he will finish with you and you go to heaven quickly. <laughs> you won't go to hell. No, 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 you won't go to hell. You'll go to heaven ahead of everybody else. Because God is jealous for the widow, for the fatherless, for the stranger, for those who are being denied justice. And they have no one to cry to. Because the ears of those who must hear are shut. And he says, if they cry to me at all. And hand over their case to me. You are in trouble. He said, but I'm, I also believe in Jesus Christ. He said, yeah. You believe in me too. But you are touching the apple of my eye. People who have no one to defend them. No one to speak for them. It doesn't mean that when a widow does something bad, don't talk about it. Because they are bad widows too. <laughs> or fatherless, we have a fatherless person comes to see you from you. Yeah, because he's fatherless, let him know. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying that when you take advantage of the weakness of the widow, the weakness of the orphan, the weakness of the stranger, the weakness of an alien who is living in your country, who has no cause to justice, and you go and steal his property because you are a citizen. God says, I will fight for him. I will fight for him. So I, I don't know. I mean, you may not like Nigerians, but if they are in a country as aliens and you mistreat them because you don't like them or like they did to us in South Africa, God says, I will fight. I will fight. Nations can get into big trouble because of the way they treat strangers. Now, it doesn't mean that the stranger is a nice person and they are not breaking our rules and they are not uh, you know, doing all kinds of things to mess up the economy, but when justice is denied, fairness is denied, there is no equity. The laws are turned upside down to fight against somebody who has no one to speak for him. He can't even hire a lawyer. And you have the power. And so you use it. God says, stand properly. So I'm just telling you, I'm, I'm your pastor, I have to tell you the truth. God wants to fight for you. But if you go and mess up with the wrong people, the Lord who must fight for you will fight against you. I hope that's, that's a good word, isn't it? I know some of you are thinking, hey, hey, is God fighting against me? What have I done wrong? <laughs> no, I'm not, it's not just about having a case with somebody. It is when you are denying justice, God will fight and this is not Old Testament. It is also New Testament. You find it in the book of James. 
Jesus said to the little children, if you mess up one of these little children, this is Jesus, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. If you mess up these children, he says, it would have been better if you had not been born. <laughs> and he says, it, 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 it would be like somebody hung a heavy load on your neck and threw you into the sea. This is New Testament. Both Jesus and James. Don't mess with people who have no defense. Leave them. Pray about their case. But don't mess with them. Because God will mess with you. And when he messes with you, sometimes it is for a long period. Transgenerationally. Finally, let me conclude. Exodus chapter 14. Verse 13 to 14, I started with it, I'm ending with it. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord which will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Three things if you want God to fight for you. First, don't be afraid, refuse fear. Throughout the Bible, God will tell people whom he wants to help, fear not, fear not, fear not. Because fear cannot dwell with God. Fear activates the power of Satan. Faith activates the power of God. So if God is fighting for you, don't fear. Fear sometimes seems very natural because the situation is fearful. But he says, fear not. It's a command. In other words, you are trying to fear, but don't. Hey, don't fear. The way, hey, don't fear. It's a command. You want God to fight for you? Fear not. Hey, fear not. That's a command. You want God to fight for you? Fear not. Number two, stand still. Don't panic. Don't run helter-skelter. Don't do anything rush. Don't be hysterical. Don't go around telling everybody about your troubles. Stand still. I know how hard it is to stand still when you are in trouble. Can you imagine if you were in Israel? Pharaoh's army is coming. They are charging. The army, they are coming with their horses. The Red Sea is not making any, showing any signs of improvement that it will open. I mean, how, how will you behave? You start running. Hey, 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 hey. And then Moses comes and says, Fear not, stand still. <laughs> you feel like running stand still you feel like telling everybody about your problem stand still you feel like stand still you want God to fight for you stand still you feel you shouldn't stand still because every instinct in you is telling you to run but he says, stand still. It's an instruction. And the third thing he says, see the salvation of the Lord. Watch God. When you fear not, you stand still. Just keep your eyes on God. Not on the sea, not on the army. Watch what the Lord would do. I came here to tell somebody, Watch what God will do for you this day. Watch what God will do for you this coming week. Watch what God is going to do for you by the end of this month. Watch what God is going to do for you by the end of this year. Stand still. 
Fear not. Stand still. Watch God. And that is the word of God I came here this morning to give to you. Watch God. Watch what he's going to do. See his salvation. See his salvation. People will start fighting each other. Watch God. He will raise a storm. He will terrify the enemy. He will use the forces of nature to disperse them. He will deliver you from the lion's den. Just watch God. Turn to somebody and tell them, watch God. Turn to another person and tell them, just stand still and watch God. Because the Lord will fight for you. Are you being denied justice? The Lord will fight for you. Is the enemy far stronger than you? The Lord will fight for you. Fear not. Stand still. Watch God. 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 Just watch him. Just watch him. Just watch him. He's about to throw some lightning and some thunder. He's about to add, allow the earth to open for people to go into the earth. He's about to open the Red Sea. He's about to shake the heavens and the earth. Just fear not. Stand still and watch God. May the Lord your God, whom you trust, and whom, in whose hand you have put your soul, May he arise and fight for you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. We're going to give our projects 